as we continue our series through the book of 1 John, our fall series. How many of you have been enjoying this, this series? Has it been good for you? And I'm going to ask if there's an LPT member who wouldn't mind coming and getting my chair and bringing it over to me. I'd really, really appreciate it. I think it's over to that side somewhere. Uh, appreciate your help with that. Okay, so here we go. Let's get opened up here. Nice to be back in the podium. We've had some great teachings over the last several weeks. It's been great to just be a part of it and to take it all in and soak it all in. But I want you to know I put a lot of work into this message today. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Uh, 1 John chapter 3 is probably one of the most difficult passages to teach and to rightly divide in all of Scripture. And you'll find out why as we get into it. Let's uh, pick it up here in chapter 2, beginning at verse 28. And we'll read all the way down through verse 10 of chapter 3. And John says, And now, dear children, continue in him, so that when he appears, we may be confident. Thank you so much, Dave. We may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, or beloved, now are we the children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who are the children of the devil are, and who the ch children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, just a few thoughts about John's place in the New Testament. And obviously, John's contribution to the New Testament is enormous. You see the Gospel of John, three epistles, and of course the book of Revelation. He's one of the major contributors to the New Testament. And Paul and John were interesting personalities, polar opposites in so many ways. And they had different personalities, and as they approach their approach to the scriptures, which is very interesting to me, both in their style of writing and in their attention to detail, is totally and completely different. So when you're reading one of the letters of Paul, here we are reading the Word of God, but it's written in such a different style, with such a different personality and flair and attention to detail. And then we go over to John, and we're still reading equally the Word of God. But it, it's, it's so different, you know, whereas Paul is very line upon line, methodically building his thoughts and arguments, John was very broad brushed, you know. Everything was, you know, speaking in vague generalities, just whew, putting it out there. And it, was, and it was really hard to follow with some of the things he was saying, like the sin that leads to death. Well, what is the sin that leads to death? He doesn't say a thing about it. He just, whew, just tosses it out there, and that's it. 
And I think it's because he, in this instance, he, there's a mutual understanding between him and the people that he's writing to about what these things are. And he doesn't feel the need to explain it. But yet God allowed this vagary to be in the scriptures for us to grapple with. And you can ask him that when you get there, why that is the case. But God has a purpose for everything. His word is perfect in this way. And I, I couldn't help doing this. I was imagining a scenario where John and Paul were together. And John was writing his, his epistle, you know. And Paul was there. And Paul just come, kind of comes over and looks over his shoulder and looks at what he's writing. He says, man, wow, that is good, brother. That is really good. But you know, they might kind of misunderstand this. You might want to give a few more details to this. Let me suggest this. They didn't have that kind of input. It wasn't a group letter. It was just John under the inspiration of the Spirit bringing what he brought and Paul under the inspiration of the Spirit bringing what he brings. And if you, you try and mix them together, try and put them together as a team, and I couldn't imagine it working. Because they think so differently and it's so evident in the way that they build their arguments. And yet in all of their differences, they are both ve vessels of God in bringing forth the God-breathed infallible revelation of God. That is so interesting to me. Now, for anyone to suggest that John's letters are easy to understand... We look at them and say, well, they're just so simple, broad brushed, very, you know, meat and potatoes, kind of just right out there. If we look at John's letters and we imagine that they are simple, kind of black and white, meat and potato style, all of this could, you really, and I believe this, we really cannot have anything other than a nominal understanding of the New Testament. Because John is anything but simple. And theologians all agree on this. It's deceptively simple. But the question and the difficulty comes not in John himself, but how John fits into the greater revelation of Scripture. How it all balances out so that we come away with a clear theology about grace and life and sin and all of these things. And John has a lot to say about these things. But once again, they're, they're very capsulized sort of little pithy or pithy proverbs that are just kind of one after another, this whole succession of things that he says there. And as a standalone letter, yeah, obviously it's very simple. You take John out of the Bible, and if that's the only Bible you have, man, it is just black and white. You don't have anything to compare to it. You just go with exactly what it says, as it says it. But when it comes to understanding John's letters in a standalone fashion, we really can't do it. It must be understood in the context of the full revelation that God has given to us. Or else, we can get off into some dangerous things. And as I'll show you here. Not that, not that John would do that. Not that he is doing that. And John brings a necessary balance even within his own writings. But I have seen it over and over again. And, and uh, theologians talk about this. How people take certain things and go to seed with them without properly balancing them against the full counsel of God. So, we have a little thing here. If I'm gonna, I'm, before I begin my comments on this, we have something going on in our church that I love. And that is that we are re literally under reconstruction. We've been here now 10, 11 years. And there's so many things, obviously, that need upgrading and need cleaning up and need help. But also, we're in the process of retooling our building to be a disaster relief center. And we're doing this through the funds that were raised through the, the Spear Foundation. And of course, Dave Seamus has been, uh, you know, busy around the building with Jay and the teams and people that would come in and Jacob and others. And they're doing electrical and they're doing plumbing and they're breaking down walls. And we got different uh, inspectors coming through here and everything. And one of the things that, that happens through all of this is that we leave quite a mess everywhere you go. So one day we were at a staff meeting and I suggested, you know, it might be a good idea if we make a little sign like the one that's going to come up behind me here. There it is. And just kind of put it all over the building here and there, you know. Please pardon our mess. We're under construction. And if you didn't have that, people could kind of get the wrong idea. They could come and say, man, these people are a bunch of pigs. 
you know, look at this carpet. I mean, it's, this downstairs carpet is screaming at me, you know. There's chalk all over the place. There's these big garbage bags. They don't know there's clothes in, front of, in those garbage bags, but there's garbage bags all over. Just, it looks like we're just, you know, a bunch of pigs. Now, if we got the building done and we still had all that going on, we'd have to take down our sign because that's what we are, pigs. <laughs> but that's not the case. We're under construction. We are working. There's a mess. And we just say, hey, look, you know, th things are happening here. We're, we're moving. We're going forward. We're making improvements. God is doing something in our midst. And we see the evidence of that with a lot of junk around and a lot of dirt around and stains in the carpet and all of these things. But, uh, but it's, all being, it's all being fixed as we speak. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and the Christian life is a lot like the church building. We're under construction. How many of you know we're still under construction? It's what Dan Chesney last week called sanctification. Yeah, we are sanctified and set apart right from the very beginning for God's purpose. But the process of sanctification is a lifelong process. We will not be out of that realm until we see him as he is. And this body has been laid aside and we are in his presence that's a hope that we carry. Until that time, we are under construction and we have and must say, please pardon our mess. And we do every time we come together for communion. Some aspect of men in our mess in our life every week that for which we need pardon. I don't know about you, but I know that's true for me. Maybe not. Maybe you're sinless. I don't know. Now, Paul is very mindful of our mess. By the way, you're not, just so you'll know, if you think you are. Paul is very mindful of our mess, and he takes great pains to outline the doctrines of grace and sanctification and spiritual warfare and the, the subtleties of the, the, the satanic uh, lure and all the how we fight the good fight and all of these things. He's very clear. I mean, obviously, there's a black and white contrast in the same way that we see in John, but John broad brushes it, but what Paul does is he breaks it out into very specific detail. He talks about the nuance of, of our life on earth as a Christian and what that's like. In fact, he talks about his own frustration with this in Romans chapter 7, verse 21 through 25, where he says, so I find this law at work, and he's going back and forth about the purity and the goodness and the wonderful thing that God is doing. And there's something that's working in me that is pure and powerful. But yet there's something else that's going on and I'm struggling with it. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For my inner being, in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Now, Paul is talking about the ongoing struggle. He's not talking about his past struggle. And the context shows that and proves that. And I, I believe that that view of his past struggle before he came to Christ is the wrong one. He's talking about something that is, is true of all of us, and we know through our own experience that we experience this and fight and battle with this. And Paul is being very open and confessional and transparent, as he always was. And he says, what a wretched man that I am. Why? Because he's got this desire to do good, this righteous thing that is happening inside of him that is just continually, this heavenward call that is continually leading him upward, but yet he's constantly having to deal with the, the body of death that clings to him as he lives in this fallen world with a fallen body. It's a mess, he's saying. And he says, who will rescue me from this mess? Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he turns his eyes to the parousia. He, begins, he thinks ahead, he looks ahead to the hope that we all have that John has outlined here. And he talks about the, the process, the, the working, the, the ultimate thing that God does in us because of that hope that we have. Thanks be to God. He says, he delivers me. And he's looking at Christ. And he says, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, he is the one who delivers me. Not only from the, this body of death and not only from a lifestyle, 
that is counterproductive to my growth. But he delivers me ultimately and finally into his presence where this body falls aside. I see him as he is. And he becomes, for me, a, the, the true mirror of what is inside of me, which is Christ. And it's pure and it's holy. Been there all along. From the moment you were born again. But yet we see through a glass darkly. Now then John comes along. And it seems, obviously, at first glance, that he writes a series of short, very vague, absolute moralistic platitudes and just plops them into the middle of our mess. Boom. You know? And we're like, wow, what is this? This has been a difficulty for theologians for centuries. Because in so many case, cases, it seems to fly in the face. It's very simple. Oh, boy, this is, oh, I don't even have to think about I don't even have to think about what, try and figure out what Paul is saying. John's just very clear, you know. If you do good, you're born of God. If you do, some, if you do bad, you're born of the devil. Oh, well, I can understand that. That's very simple. But is it really simple? Is it? And the difficulty is especially seen in chapter 3 and verses 4 down through 10. Now, chapter 2 and verse 29, he states the thesis of what it is that's to come in chapter 3. And he says this, If you know that he is righteous, and he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. That is absolutely right. That is the word of God. We need to look at that very seriously and take it very seriously but it almost has has kind of a bippity boppity boom kind of you know sense to it he's not going to bother explaining that or nuancing it in any way he just takes it as it is and just poof, there it is and sometimes you know there's difficulties that can be fraught with that for example it's broad brushed it's sweeping notice the word no k n o w John uses this word more than any other writer. It's all through this epistle. You know this. You know that. He's suggesting that we can, can rightly judge who's a Christian and who's not by observing their actions. You know. You can observe. You can see. If they do good, okay, they're born of God. If they don't do good, they're not born of God. It's also difficult because there are a great many people who can do what is right and not be born of him we see it all the time I mean what would happen if a Christian wife lived with a non-Christian husband and there was nothing that that guy could do that would ever be good he could bring her home roses he could care for her in a very special way he can love her in, in, in ways that many Christians don't even know and or understand or have in their own home but yet, perhaps in her mind, whatever, or his mind as the case may be, because they happen to take this at such face value, they believe that no matter what that man can do, it cannot be good. It's got to be coming from some kind of a wrong motivation because the Bible plainly says, if you're not born again, you're not going to be, if you don't, you know, well, or maybe you can say he's doing good, so he must be born of God. But yet he's never maybe even, even heard about Jesus. Maybe he's never even come to church. He doesn't have any understanding of the scriptures at all. But we could make the assumption, well, my husband is doing all this wonderful stuff. He must be born of God. You can see where the difficulty begins to kind of get into this. It's a judgment, or it seems to be a judgment that is based on what we see. But God looks at the heart. Man looks at appearances, but God sees the heart, right? Right? So it can't be about discerning motivations spiritually. It can't be about that. Because he's very plainly saying, you look at their actions and you can see whether or not they're a Christian. But a deceiver can do what's right. You can have, you know, there's been like charlatan snake oil preachers before who have gotten, gotten up there and didn't have any relationship with God at all. I remember a guy years ago who came to our church, not this church, it was a church I attended when I was very young in the Lord, and he didn't know Jesus at all, but he, he bamboozled all of us, and then he stole a bunch of our stuff as he was leaving, you know? We found out. Why? He looked like he was doing right. He had all the testimonies right. He did it, but yet 
It was a lie. He was deceiving. So obviously we can't go by mere appearances and what we see. This can't mean exactly what it is that that's saying there. Also, there are a great many people who do not do what is right and are born of him. How many have ever been in that category? How many have ever acted or behaved in such a way that you would, people, other people would look at it and say, that's not right? I've done that recently. They look at you and say, hey, you know, well, so what does that mean now? What does that mean? So th- th- this can get very, very fuzzy, can it? And that idea creates a world of problems. And people who just grab hold of that idea usually end up either on one side mean-spirited, self-righteous Pharisees who believe that they got it all together and that they can look around and that they can judge other Christians and other people and judge whether or not they're saved by, you know, really just kind of measuring themselves against their own righteousness. Because that's all that can ever be is self-righteousness when we do that. Or, on the other side, you can end up under condemnation that seems inescapable. Because you know you sin. Because you know you do, don't do right. You know that there are things in your life for which you need to ask forgiveness continually. Like I said, we, Martin Luther talked about daily repentance. We repent. We re- but yet these things are still there. So what is, what is John talking about here? Well, let's look at verses 4 through 10 here. And I want you to, as I'm reading this, notice this chart that comes up on the back here. Because we're not going to kind of parse this thing verse by verse. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, something I think that will help you. Because what you're going to see is that verses 4 through 8, 4 through 7, are essentially saying the exact same thing as verses 8 through 9. Except they're said in different ways. And you can see that up there. For example, there's an introductory phrase, whoever commits a sin... And then over here, he that commits sin, verse 8. The theme is, the nature of sin is lawlessness. The origin of sin, verse 8, is the devil. The purpose of Christ appearing, verse 5, he was manifested to take away our sins. And then, of course, in verse 8, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. That's how he took away our sins, by destroying the works of the devil. And then the logical conclusion, no one who abides in him sins, verse 6, and then verse uh, 9, no one born of him, God commits sins. So it's just, it's repeating, it's, 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 there's a redundancy there. So listen to it now. He says, everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. What was the purpose of Jesus' coming? To take away, to remove our sins. And in him, obviously, there is no sin. That was necessary for him to be the perfect substitutionary sacrifice. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Okay, well, we're just speaking to that difficulty, aren't we? No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Okay, dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to, st- to destroy the works of, or the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. How many of you have ever looked at this in your utter mess and have had a problem with it? Nobody. I'm the only one. Boy, I'm going home. Honestly, come on. How many of you have ever even read 1 John? Let me we can start there. So this seems like a very straightforward, simple series of brief, pithy statements. They're almost like Proverbs. But it is anything but simple. In fact, it is perhaps the most difficult passage to rightly divide in all the New Testament. And I approach it. And I have prayed about this this week, and I said, God, I, want, I have such a desire to demonstrate the appropriate and respect and humility in all of this, because I don't know either. All I know is that there's a lot of very well-studied people who have different views on this. In fact, Hallman Commentary says that secession of brief statements continues. 
He's commenting on this verse. He says, when scrutinized more carefully, they defy common understanding and lead to disagreement amongst Bible teachers. I have found no two commentaries that agree on what John meant in these verses. Therefore, if we have a difficult time understanding this passage, we can take some comfort in the fact that everyone seems to find it difficult. And the difficulty is not, as we said, in the passage itself. It's very simple in its language. But the difficulty is in how it fits into the full revelation of Scripture. So it's probably best understood in the light of this bigger picture. Now I want to talk to you about a few positions that are taken with this, uh, this particular passage. First is the assumptive position. And this is an unstudied kind of first, you know, impression. You generally won't find scholars who bring this out, but you can draw this from some of the scholarly views can lead to this, uh, this frame of reference. The assumptive is not good theology at all. It just kind of, what it does is it springs from the assumptions drawn out of ignorance. It just, for example, just looks at the thing and just takes it for what it is, doesn't study it, but just goes with it. And ignorance would manifest itself by assuming this passage was clear and easily understood. Which, when we take the passage at face value, will lead us to one of two conclusions. It's very carefully. The most brilliant scholars of the, in the world do not look at this passage and see that it's easily understood. So who are we in our casual reading through the scriptures just go through and say, oh, well, this is simple and this is clear. When we do that, we come up with some false assumptions. Here's the first one. I'm condemned because I failed to live a sinless, in sinless perfection. I am hopelessly estranged from God. I am of the devil because I sin. Condemnation coming down. Number two, because I am a good Christian, I have risen above sin. This is a delusion that we've been talking about. No, I don't, I don't sin anymore. Ever heard anybody say that? A lot of times, and this can come out of this particular view, where this mask that even mask your own motivations and what's happening in your own life, and you just sort of glaze over with this idea that you're actually living what it says here in the scriptures perfectly. And with this comes the assumption of superiority and the right to judge others. Why? Because John plainly says, by this you will know. And you could just say, okay, he sinned, he's of the devil, okay. He's good, yeah, yeah, he's good, he's of God, okay. She's of the devil, he's of God. And I'll tell you, this gets into a church, this has happened a few times in our church where this kind of thinking has gotten in there, and it is ugly. It is mean-spirited. It is, there's so much arrogance and self-righteousness when people just take this and run with it, with this sort of surfacey, superficial understanding of what John is saying here, and they just, they don't, you just don't get it, you know? John says, this is how we know. Yeah, it is how we know. But is it meant to be a litmus test in that way? Is that what John was getting at? Was this meant for church discipline in a way to kind of mete out who the good guys and the bad guys are in the church based on what they're doing or not doing? Is that what John is saying here? I don't think so. Here are the four studied theological positions of verses 4 through 10. I'm going to give them very quickly. Number one is the willful sin position. And the way I'm going to give these to you is just by reading these positions right from Hallman's commentary because I think that's the, the fastest and best way to give it the best um, rendering we can of this. Hallman says this, according to this interpretation, the willful sin position, the statement is referring to willful, deliberate sins. Now, this is one point of view, okay? You have to understand, I'm not saying which, that this is right necessarily. I'm saying that this is one of four schools of thought. According to this interpretation, the statement is referring to willful, deliberate sins as opposed to involuntary, un unintentional sins and errors. The interpretation raises three problems. First, even saintly people can commit major premeditated sins. Second, distinguishing between voluntary and involuntary sins is very difficult. And third, the text gives no indication that such a limited definition of sin is meant. Rather, the text clearly talks about all sin. Number two, the habitual sin position. 
Holman said, according to this view, the text means we cannot adopt a lifestyle of willful, unrepentant sin. The verbs in these sentences are present tense, which means, as the NIV has translated it, don't keep on sinning. We will sin, they say. We may sin badly, as Peter did, cursing and denying Jesus, or as the Corinthians did, tolerating adultery and committing violations of the Lord's Supper. We may go through a spell of backsliding, as the churches in Asia did, but we will never settle down into a lifestyle that is characterized by sin. So, once again, that's the habitual sin uh, problem. The ideal character position. Holman said, those who hold to this view point out that the text claim that a Christian does not sin states that what ought to be the character of the Christian life, but not necessarily what is the character of all Christians. We ought to strive for the ideal, even if we will not reach it. We will be better off trying and failing than if we have never tried at all. The truth might be that you cannot keep from sinning, but the balancing truth is that you ought to to try. That's the uh, ideal character position. And the fourth one is the new man position. Holman says, according to this view, Scripture teaches that the new man is a perfect new creation. In Ephesians 4.24, the Apostle Paul says the new self is, quote unquote, created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The New American Standard Version reads, and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness and truth. It's like Dan was talking about last week. This is in keeping with the assertion in Romans 7.15. I do not want to do this, but I do what I hate to do. Why does he hate to do it? Because his newborn, recreated, righteous, holy spirit that is incorruptible is being grieved within his own heart. That's what this is out. He says, I, may, I myself, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Now, here is the biblical controlling insight that brings this into balance, I believe, for me. As Christians... We really only have one nature in this way. When we're talking about the fundamental root, the, the spirit within us, that part of us which makes us, as they say, special to ourselves, our spirit that God breathed into us, that life, we became an animated soul as we lived in this body. But yet that spirit within us, indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, is not a dirty spirit. It is not a fallen spirit anymore. It is a newly regenerated, completely pure spirit within where the Holy Spirit himself comes within us by faith. God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, it says in Galatians 4, 6, because that's what happened at, at the new birth. It was a finished deal. It was a done deal. And he made us children in his likeness and in our spirits fully in keeping with everything that is true and holy and right in God. The spirit being willing, but the flesh being weak. And as Christians, we really only have one nature. We have been born of God. And as John said, his divine seed remains in us. But we live every day with the residue of the old man with that fallen creation that we just wear like a coat around our spirit that is st still full of all of the old tendencies and the things, the mess that is just that we, that we carry around and the proclivities to be drawn in the world by that fallen nature, which is not me in the, as Paul is saying, in the most truest and essence, uh, essence of who I am spiritually. But nevertheless, it's a nature of the flesh that, it, that encompasses me. And I live in the context of this fallen world with this fallen body of death about me. One day that's all going to change, but not now. Our spiritual man is born perfect and totally in line with our heavenly calling in Christ. So that when we see him as he is, when that time comes, when we will see him as he is, it'll no longer be through a glass darkly. 
And nothing will change in regard to our new nature. It'll be like coming home. It'll be like, wow. It'll be like, this is it. This is, this is what's in me. This is who I am. I see Christ reflected in me. And now I see him as he is. And I'm just like him. And all of the stuff and all of the junk, it all just falls away and it's done. And it will be great joy to be unencumbered by the world and the flesh, even though now we have to deal with the lure of the old sinful life. But to be a, a, in nature a child of the devil, which means that you're not born again, which means that you, that, that you are of your father, the God of this age, who has blinded the minds of unbelievers and blinded their hearts, blinded their spirits are blind. And it's just as fleshy as any, any other part of our lives. That's what it's like before we come to Christ. You know, and for, and for someone in that condition to suddenly see him as he is, it's worse than death. It's ultimate judgment. It's the last thing they want. There is no hope for that because they don't desire that. And there's no unencumbering because we ourselves are the encumbered instrument. But God preserves a seed within us waiting for that day. There may be good things that can be done in the world by worldly humankind, but the light of Christ will only shine through his church. The light of righteousness, the light that John is talking about here, the light of doing good as, God, as John defines it, as it is defined in scriptures, the light that comes from Jesus, that shines from his face into our hearts, this treasure that we have in earthen, earthen vessels is not a kind of righteousness that the world knows or can know. It is a righteousness that is of God. And doing right in this context, as John is talking about, means that it is that which emanates from God. It glorifies and honors God. It loves his church. It builds his church. It especially has to do with faith and hope and love and mercy and the fruits of the Spirit, which the world can sort of caricature, but it can never, ever come truly from the Spirit of God and that place of righteousness which is in the heart of the believer that doesn't need to be lauded for it, that doesn't need in any case to be... To be uh, exalted for it, but his only desire is to give glory to God. Only desire is to see God's purpose and will done. That is what is in your heart. It is oftentimes clouded. You can oftentimes find yourself wanting to take a little of the glory or the flesh wanting some righteousness of its own, of its own but the cross always cancels all of it and brings us right back to the righteousness and the person of Jesus Christ that fills our heart. And when we live out of that place within us, we are doing a kind of good that is eternal in nature, has eternal effect. The world cannot do that. The world does not have that component. I think people can do good things. So we a lot of good things, you know, done in the world by people with good intentions. But it's an entirely different place that it comes from. Holman quotes the Bible Knowledge Commentary. He says, the regenerate life in one sense, the, the regenerate, I'm sorry, the regenerate life is in one sense an es essentially and fundamentally sinless life in your spirit. And that's not to be confused with the idea of the Gnostics. This is something that the Bible teaches. Our spirit is and remains always sealed and protected by God. We are sinless in our spiritual nature. That's what the commentator is talking about here. For the believer, sin is an abnormal and, and unnatural thing. His whole bent in life is away from sin. Now, when I was a young Christian, there was a lot of things that fell off right away, as I think Dan was talking about that. It just falls off. And then there's those sort of naggy things that are there, you know, throughout our whole life that we continue, like whack-a-mole, you know. You whack it down, you know, and it's gone. You think you're finally free of it. Come back, you know, next week or the next day, sometimes even years. Sometimes you could, the mole seems like it's gone for years. All of a sudden, that old mole comes up again, and you're whacking the mole again. You know, and that's, that's what it can feel like sometimes, growing in these ways. But our natural bent, the heavenly call, word with, call within us, brings us away from sin. And insofar as God is experienced by a believer in spiritual 
realms, that experience is sinless. Your communion with him is sinless in that way. It is absolutely perfect as a new creation. And by insisting on this point, John was seeking to refute a false conception about sin. He goes on. Sin is not, nor ever can be, anything but satanic. That's what he's saying. It cannot be anything but satanic. Satan traffics in darkness. And the only area of darkness that remains in the Christian is in the unfallen body of death that we carry around. And God is continually, through the process of walking with him, sanctifying those areas of darkness in our mind, those old habits, those old ways, that faulty thinking, all of that stuff. Our whole life is under construction as God is cleaning up the mess through, through sanctification. But that spirit within, that is essential to that sanctification. That reborn spirit within that is full of the Holy Spirit, full of Christ, that is essential to being able to do that in the power of the Spirit. And that's why Romans 8 says, continues on after that section about the body of death, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of who gives life, has set me free from the law of sin and death. I can't believe I am not going to finish this message today. Because I hadn't even gotten to the part that's going to make sense. <sighs> has any of this made sense to you? Yes. Clap to the Lord if it's made sense. <laughs> All right. So that means I can quit? Because the real punch is, is coming here, you know. I don't want you walking out here with anything confusing. Let me just kind of look through my notes here for a second. What we can't do. Okay. I will say this. This passage is not in any way, a weaponized litmus test to identify false Christians in the church. And people who have done that have become the ugliest Christians I have ever known. We cannot make identity judgments, which really what this is all about. John is not intending for us to take this and to make identity judgments with other Christians. He himself understands that we will sin because he said plainly, when anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. You know, he's the one who said that. He brings his own balance to this very cut and dry, you know, bippity boppity section here that he just kind of plopped in in here. But there's a balance to all of this. Okay. Uh, we can't make identity judgments about people, including ourselves, based on whether they sin or do not sin. Because we all, we all do. The Bible is clear, do not judge. And Paul, as we will see next time, explodes that whole idea of being able to rightly discern who is saved and who isn't, you know, amongst Christians. We'll, we'll get to that next time. Let's see if there's anything here that is essential to today's message. Ooh, that's good. Oh, that Tim Teller Keller quote, quote is really good. You're going to love that. Let me see here. Um, <laughs> Oh, my word. Yeah, and then, of course, we got to talk about the love of God and all that in the next part. See, mm, 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 oh, that's good. Oh, yeah, oh, man, that's good. Let's see. Oh, that'll be good, too. Yep, yep, that brings balance to that. Yes, yeah, all that. Oh, yeah, this is going to be good. All right, so we'll, uh, we'll save that for next time, okay? <laughs> I wet you whistle with it. The most, the, 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 it's a one-two punch. We already gave one side. We're going to give the other side tomorrow. So don't prejudge this message because this is hard stuff to teach. I'm telling you, this is one of the hardest messages you, you can ever teach. And I think most pastors would agree with that because 1 John chapter 3 is not simple. Okay? All right. I'm going to have the band come up and we're going to close the service after we pray. Father, thank you so much. For the beautiful disposition of your grace and the power of your spirit, God, to lead us into all truth. And Lord, I know in closing, as I'm thinking about this, there's been different views that have come through uh, different schools of thought and people with, who are uh, well-learned, good-intentioned, godly people have different ways of viewing this. And Father, we want to thank you, God, for all of it. And even in the lack of clarity that we have, God, I believe that you've shown us a way forward, Father, that is not going to land 
uh, tender hearts into seasons of condemnation and frustration. Father, help us to see the pure simplicity that you've given to us through the gospel of Jesus Christ, the irreducible point of simplicity that we have in your absolute forgiveness and in the cleansing of your blood that has saved us from our sins, saved us from the penalty of our sins, and you've given to us a hope, a hope that draws us on, a hope that draws us into a purifying process whereby, Father, we grow in you in a way that we can grow in no other way. We can't grow this way in the world because the world, as John said, doesn't even understand it. But Lord, you've given us, Lord, as those who are of the Spirit, you've given us and you've shown us, Lord, through the Scriptures and through the teaching and the anointing of the Holy Spirit within us, you've given us a view, God, that is so real and so powerful and so true to us that we stick with you all the way, God, to the other side until we see you as you are. We persevere because of what you have given to us. You have anchored us, Father, in the truth that sets us free. And I pray, Father, that I would in no way do violence to these passages, Father, but only bring, Father, what is truly intended and in the true heart of this apostle as he pens these words for our, for our good under God's direction, Father. May, Father, that be the case. And I pray for every soul, every listening ear who hear, hears today and can resonate with the things that I'm saying. And will understand, Father, that there is a way forward for them in Christ. And maybe that's you this morning. You say, gee, you know, Pastor, I really need to, I'm hearing now that, you know, Christ died for me. And I don't think I've never, I've never really even received Christ as my Savior. I know it. I know that I'm lost and without God. And according to the scriptures, the Bible tells and says that, you know, unless we're born again, we cannot see the kingdom of God. And I see that now. And I want to come, I want to be saved. I want to come to Christ. I want to come to Jesus. Today's my day, Lord. Well, don't let this day go by. After the service, come on up over here to the far side of where I'm at under that screen that's rolled up in the corner there. Come over there. Someone will be there to meet you. We can pray with you. We can give you some materials to get you started on your way, on your journey, and we can continue our growth together. Amen?